Hey, yo! From the Kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Great to be here with you guys, and I'm psyched you are all here with me. My guest this episode is Scarlet Ravenswood. Scarlet has a blog called Arcane Alchemy that delves deeply into topics such as paganism, Wicca, and witchcraft. Scarlett and I are going to be talking about those topics at large, including social media's role in both the promotion of witchcraft as well as the dramatic digital cauldron it brews for witches and pagans online. We're talking things like emoji spells, hashtag be the witchy change, the hex trump movement, witchcraft cameos, and feminist pro. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hey guys, Ryan Sprague here. When I was 12 years old, I saw something in the sky that I couldn't explain, and I've been searching for answers ever since. And now, I want you to join me on that search every Monday for the Somewhere in the Skies podcast. Hear from both researchers and experiencers as we dissect these deeply complex phenomena one mystery at a time. Available now on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, or at somewhereintheskies.com. Remember, keep your feet on the ground, but never stop searching somewhere in the skies. We now return to your regular programming. What the fuck was that? Ryan Sprague just interrupting the show like that? What is going on here? Anyways, so Scarlett and I are going to also be talking about Norse mythology and its resurgence in popular culture after being demonized for so long as well as some discussion on the tarot, ritual rose baths, cord magic, and a Japanese horror manga that I think everyone should read. You may enjoy the chat, or you may not. Shrug. Either way, here it is. Scarlet Ravenswood. Hey, thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. We can't go any further. We have to talk about your name first. So, oh, okay. Yeah, could you could you tell people what the name means? Well, I was kind of looking at different names that I could p- potentially use that I could associate with my pagan practice and it's kind of a popular thing for pagans and witches to choose kind of an alternative name. And I just always liked the name Scarlet and I love that color, so I'm like, you know, it it feels good, it fits, why not give it a go? And um, it's worked out pretty well. Um, It's a lot more interesting than my legal name, which is Sarah. So it's kind of fun to try something new out. How long ago did you get into this pagan practice? Well, I probably started um, around 13 or so. I was growing up in the like early 2000s, late 90s. There was kind of a popular resurgence in um, things like Wicca, like they had the movie Practical Magic and the craft and things like that. So a lot of um, witches in my generation were kind of inspired initially by that. And then one thing led to another. And um, I started, you know, looking at books and even at my like local borders, you know, they had that tiny bookshelf of, you know, metaphysical books. And I would sneak over there and um, just start reading. And it kind of just grew from there. Um, I eventually got to visit Salem when I was a bit older. And at that point, I was just like, yep, this is this is it. This feels like home to me. So, yeah, it's, it's not too different in origin story, I guess, as a, a lot of other um, pagans my age, I imagine, have, have similar, similar moments <laughs> like that. Right. Man, you mentioned borders. That's a real blast from the past. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you went to Salem when you were younger. What was that trip like? Yeah, so I was only maybe like 14 or so, and um, my parents had been driving up there to see some relatives nearby, and I had convinced them to do a little like day tour through Salem, and I, I managed to convince them, okay, so we, we went down there, and I was just mesmerized by all the shops and, and everything and the people, and it was just the beauty of the, the small you know town itself and, and New England in general, so... Mm-hmm. It just was, you know, a really inspiring experience. What was the, because I've never been there, so I'm curious as to, you know, if you're maybe empathic on some level, what was the vibe like there? It was very open in the sense that 
when you walk around in Salem, like you're going to see a lot of different types of people wearing various different things. And that was a big shock for me coming from a um, another small town that was a lot more conservative. Um, so when you walk around, you see all these like, you know, different types of people like hippies and other people wearing like capes just walking around. It was just such like an an open culture and atmosphere and friendly and I don't know it just it just felt great and I'm going back there in a couple months for a little trip so I'm looking forward to that as well is that your first time back um yes so that'll be my first time back there um recently I went to um New Orleans which is another one of the kind of meccas I would say in America for 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 pagans and that was Definitely another, you know, unique experience in in a similar fashion that there's a lot of different types of people that you meet there. Um, it's very open, very accepting, and um, definitely has that kind of like undercurrent of magic running through it for sure. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about Salem. I've read conflicting stories about the witch trials in Salem. I was wondering if you had any insight into that. I was talking to somebody a few episodes ago, and I had briefly mentioned that I had came across an anecdote that said the Salem witch trials were maybe a, a little exaggerated, or they may have never even taken place. Have you ever come across anything like that? Um, well, I think they definitely took place. I think it was there was a news story recently that kind of found the specific area where the trials took place, which is now a more wooded area and not in the main kind of center of town that tourists go to. In terms of the the vibe there, I mean, I did go to um, the cemetery where they have um, the grave sites of some of the um, people that were killed in the witch trials. It did kind of have like a, a heavy feeling to that atmosphere. So I think there is kind of that underlying residual energy, perhaps. Right. And then kind of in the way that it's become part of our culture and our history, it kind of kind of feeds that energy still. Um, so it's still present. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but but kind of we had this whole like cultural fixation upon Salem. And so when we visit there, we're expecting, you know, to feel certain things. And maybe by expecting this, we kind of, you know, become more sensitive to those energies and can pick up on it a bit more than yeah. maybe you would elsewhere. Definitely. And energy doesn't lie. So I'm going to assume that whatever I saw or read was just completely bogus. Because I, I did this the last time too. I brought it up. I had no idea where I saw it or heard it. I couldn't quote anything from it. But it just stuck with me. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. I never heard that it might not have happened or it might have been exaggerated. But as somebody who's been there, I'm going to take your word for it. Because like I said, if you're walking through a cemetery where people are buried, you know, and granted, there are other people buried there too. But that residual energy is not going to lie to you. I mean, if it's pretty heavy like that, I would imagine that something horrific did take place there. Before we go any further, too, we should we should tell people uh, you have a, a great blog called Arcane Alchemy. Yeah. Uh, that's Thanks. a really cool name, too. I love the name. Tell people a little bit about the blog and what you write about. My blog is, is um, has a pretty wide scope. I try and make it as all-encompassing as I possibly can. But in general, I write about paganism and certain aspects of Wicca and traditional witchcraft as well. I have some fiction pieces, some um, spell ideas, some craft, you know, ideas. And I kind of just use it as a way of recording um, my own path and my own journey and thoughts throughout my kind of pagan learning experience. And I've been working on it for, for over a year now. And I've just kind of gotten to the point where where my website, Arcane Alchemy, is now my full-time job, and I'm so happy that I'm able to put so much more time and effort into it and really kind of work on crafting my writing and developing um, my photography skills and, you know, working on the aesthetics of everything. So it's kind of coming together now, and, and it's pretty exciting. I really, really like doing it. I had to teach myself, you know, web design and graphic design and <laughs> all this stuff that I wasn't as familiar with, but it's pretty rewarding learning that stuff too. Yeah, I mean, I'm in the same boat as you. I had to learn all that too just to start this podcast. So it's a pretty satisfying experience to 
put your energy into a project like a blog or a podcast and then actually see the return on your investment. Yeah. And, and it's, it's fun watching it grow too. Um, so like, you know, it started small before, before I was on a different platform and, you know, I just had maybe like a handful of readers and then I switched over to Squarespace, which is what my blog's on now. That's really, you know, been helpful with kind of how they lay the site out, um, how you can look at analytics and everything like that. It's, it's, it gives you a lot of encouragement to keep on going when you see that people are engaged and interested. So. Definitely would agree. I also host on Squarespace, uh, not to plug Squarespace, because I think every podcast plugs Squarespace. But um, <laughs> yeah, so what was it about paganism that drew you to it at such a young age? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say because I um, grew up in, for the most part, a, a non-religious household. So I know a lot of people who come to paganism are coming from like a Catholic background or a Christian background or something else like that. But I was pretty much raised in a non-religious household, um, only having gone to church like a couple times or so. So I didn't have as much of that fear and trepidation that a lot of people get when they first start reading about the occult or paganism or things like that. Um, I kind of just started learning and, and it kind of just felt right. I've always been one to enjoy being out in nature and kind of found some type of divinity in being around, being out in nature and exploring and things like that. So when, when I realized that, you know, there was this whole belief system kind of set up and based around that, it just like, it felt like it, it fit totally. And, you know, being a, a young teenager, when I started, I was just like in love with the idea. I started off with mostly, um, Wicca practices, and I just love the idea of there being like a god and a goddess with like equal power and importance, and how that was so different from a lot of the other more popular religions out there. And I was just like, this is perfect. This is this is for me, and I think to a large extent that this is for kind of the future of the country or society in some way. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking <laughs> right. a bit ahead of myself, but you know, I I think I think there's a lot of positive lessons there. And I think more people are discovering that. Do you so. think that, well, I mean, obviously as a practicing pagan, you, you won't think this. I'm going to ask it anyways. Do you think that drawing people away from traditional religions is a bad thing for culture and society? You know, I think time will tell. It's it's tough because different religions, you know, have different histories and and different effects on our social structures and things like that. And I do think that there is a lot of change going on within, especially the millennial generation is kind of losing religious interest in the main monotheistic religions. And, and I wonder, like, are they, you know, just becoming agnostic and just kind of stepping out and just not, not really focusing on religion or making it a, a major part of their life, which is most of my friends, you know, are just kind of agnostic you know, who might have grown up religious going to church or something like that, and they've just kind of left. So it's kind of created this big gap among people my age and in my generation where they kind of just left what they grew up with and now are kind of just not doing much or, or worrying too much about their own spirituality. And I'm not sure where paganism could or should fit in within that realm, but I think it's definitely good that it's an option that's there for people to discover if they do want to like pick it back up, start thinking about some of those bigger questions. It's definitely, you know, a great platform for that. So I, I wonder what's going to happen. I mean, a lot is changing, especially in like America with that. Yeah, I would agree. And, and you brought up, you know, younger people, uh, younger generations and, you know, social media has changed a lot of things about our culture and, and our society and the way we communicate and how we spread messages. And one thing that relates here to what we're talking about is, you know, how social media has helped popularize or even just flat out introduce these ideas like paganism and Wicca and occultism to, you know, new and different and younger people. What do you make of this movement across social media um, I think it's I think it's exciting mostly. Um, I love like having people message me or they find me on Instagram and they 
they're like just discovering like what is witchcraft what is paganism and they're, they're just asking me these questions and they're just kind of finding me and, and other um, pagans through Instagram and, and Twitter and um, social media and in general and then so you have all this like kind of it's easy for them to connect and share all these you know what they're working on sharing like you know how does spell work work uh, how does ritual work um, all these all these great things that people are able to collaborate and communicate with at the same time, because the internet is everything, you know, and people run into misinformation a lot of times too, which can be tricky to kind of weed that out. I know when I started, we had just gotten on the internet in our home. So I was researching this stuff and I found like a lot of weird, (laughs) weird stuff. And I didn't know what to believe when I was starting out and um, I'm sure a lot of younger people are struggling with that, maybe even more so because there's even more information out there to decipher. Right. And then it's it's interesting too. There's all these. I'm not as big on Tumblr, um, but there's like this huge movement of of kind of younger younger girls on Tumblr that are like sharing all their information, what they're learning, and they're even like incorporating technology with. They come up with these things like emoji spells. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I've witch. seen that, and that's something. Yeah, I talked to a witch, uh, the same person that I or the same episode that I brought up when I mentioned Salem. We were going to talk about digital witchcraft. We didn't have time for it though. But that's what you're talking about right now, and that's that was something that I was reading about a few months ago. You know, this this community on Tumblr that's essentially casting spells through emoji. It blew my mind. Yeah. I'm not sure where I, you know, what I think about that quite yet. Like on the one hand, I'm like super excited that all these young people are so so interested in all of this. And then at the other hand, I'm like, well, that's that's a bit different and I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how effective emoji spells might be, but I mean, if you're putting your intention behind it, then Yeah, that's true. Then you know, I guess. I think the main point is it's just good there's, you know, people interested in it. Do you think that's any different though than memes or meme magic? I you know it might it might be the same. And I was thinking about that the other day just like memes and and their power over society and and a lot of people think like, you know, not to bring politics into it, but like, you know, Trump was partly elected through this Pepe meme and like all of this the power of of memes and and spreading of this kind of information and and what that means and how much power that has. So I'm not sure, you know, where, where I feel, you know, about kind of memes and emoji spells and things like that, but it, it's definitely something and it's something I didn't anticipate um, happening when I was starting out, but it's kind of cool to see where it goes. I mean, I like technology and I like thinking about the future of tech. So it's kind of fun to, to see, you know, how people, the younger people, especially are kind of taking witchcraft and incorporating it, you know, in their own, lives through technology which is their medium for expression yeah let's talk about some of your mediums for expression what sorts of things do you practice i do a variety of different things most of the stuff i do is um wicca based though i do sometimes venture into kind of traditional witchcraft practices but i definitely do full moon rituals and new moon rituals and things like that um i do um different types of spells i um, make my own sigils. Um, so I work sometimes a little bit with chaos magic and things like that. But um, yeah, and on my blog, I kind of just share my my experience. I'll like um, come up with a spell and and you know I'll give it a try and and kind of write about the results if it works. If it doesn't work, um, magic's kind of like a you got to just go and try it and see what happens. It's a very DIY, or at least I think of it as a, a DIY kind of thing that you do. Um, so when I was younger, I used to kind of just follow books and, and did, you know, got the ingredients and did the things in the order that they told me. But now I'm much more um, kind of just go with my intuition on it and make sure I keep a record of it so I can keep on building upon what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Now, I have a very surface level interest in witchcraft and magic and I'd like to get into it more seriously, but I, I don't think that I'm ready for it. I, I don't think I have the right mindset. Is that important, or can I just get into it whenever? 
I think the mindset's important for it to work because it's all about no matter what materials you are or are not using, it's all about intention and then visualizing that your intention becoming reality. So you can do magic with just, you know, a candle and it could be like a really powerful spell, but your mindset has to be has to be there and you have to fully believe that it will work in order for it to come to fruition. So you kind of need to build up, you know, meditation practice, visualization skills to increase, you know, the likelihood of your intentions becoming reality. But at the same time, sometimes you kind of just have to fake it till you make it too if you're worried about things being perfect because sometimes you just might need to go through the motions a couple times before you feel comfortable in in the process in belief. I mean, I struggle with belief a lot too sometimes. So sometimes it just helps to just do it and yeah. kind of get over those initial fears. Just just get it over with and, and keep trucking and then it'll start to feel less less weird or or less odd and and then you can start really putting some belief behind it. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, you know, what sort of advice you could give me to get started. And you mentioned meditation and visualization techniques. I go in spurts with meditation. I'll, I'll do it for a few weeks or a couple of months and then I'll, I'll miss a day, you know, kind of like, like physical exercise. You just miss a day and you're like, ah, fuck it. I'm not going to do it anymore. But I'm wondering how important the setting is. Do I need an actual dedicated space for this? Oh, definitely not. I mean, you have to work with what what you have. I'm in I'm in the city of Chicago, so you know there's not much space in in my apartment. So I kind of just set up in the in the middle of my living room, <laughs> <laughs> usually. And um, I just kind of I have various items throughout different shelves um, in my apartment. I just kind of collect and gather my stuff if I'm doing a spell or. And just bring it literally onto the floor of my living room because, you know, you got to work with what you got. Sometimes I'm able to do spell work or, or meditation outside, which is excellent. But, you know, it's really cold here a lot of the time. So mm -hmm. I kind of just have to to work with, you know, this the space you do have. And I wouldn't worry too much about about things, you know, being being perfect or the perfect setup. I mean, we all would love to have like a a separate, you know, witchy room or <laughs> something. And maybe yeah. I will someday, but, but not, you know, not today. So I kind of just, you know, just make it work. <laughs> well, you mentioned that you've written blogs on things that have worked, things that haven't worked. What has your success rate been like since you've started doing this? Well, it varies because it's a learning process. I would say I've, um, before I, left my previous job to work on my blog full time. I used to always do like um, new job spells when I needed to get a new job. And those have worked pretty well for me in the past. I do a lot of little kind of daily spells to just kind of decrease anxiety and bring kind of a positive energy to my day. And those are like super simple things like with like your morning cup of tea, just maybe like putting the honey in in your tea and like invoking pentagram and like putting your intention of, you know, a positive day into your cup of tea. So when you drink it afterwards, you just feel like a sense of like calm and optimism. And those are like super little things that I do daily. And since I've started doing those things daily, my anxiety level is way lower and I much more have much more energy. And I know a lot of people might say, well, that's just, you know, like placebo effect or something like that. And perhaps maybe it is, but I just, I don't, I don't worry about it because if it's works, then, then it's working. Yeah. That's something that I struggle with too, is regardless of whether this result was manifested in my own mind, if I feel like physically or mentally better or clearer, why is that a problem? That's a positive thing for me, right? Yeah, and, and initially I struggled a lot with that. And I, I still do because I don't have a lot of other friends that practice witchcraft or are pagans or anything like that. So I kind of, I'm always around people that, that might think what I'm doing is, is BS if I tell them, which I often don't tell people, but hmm. only certain people know. But um, But then I kind of just realized, you know, I don't want to let their 
assumptions or negativity about it, you know, cloud my own belief. And I, I know it works because it's made, you know, a positive changes in my life. So I try and, and not let their like criticism or, or lack of belief kind of cloud my own optimism, I guess, about it. Well, and, but that took a while to get over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Shit, I just lost my train of thought. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that you do – actually, now I forget which one you mentioned. Did you say that you did more traditional Wicca or witchcraft? I mostly do um, Wicca. So I've been reading up a lot more about um, traditional witchcraft lately, um, like this year. I found this other great blogger. Her name is Sarah Ann Lawless. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Um, But she's just like blowing my mind. She just seems really cool. And she writes about kind of just, you know, getting out of your living room and getting back into the forest and reconnecting with these kind of wild energies and like hedge crossing and, you know, doing certain rituals alone, you know, by yourself in the woods and just things like that, that kind of like are maybe a bit spookier than other than stuff I've done in the past, but are really exciting at the same time. And I've been wanting to, you know, try out some of that stuff. So, so we'll see what happens. And I think in general, there's been kind of a, a movement slightly away from Wicca and more towards some more like traditional practices, kind of moving away from the um, Wiccan read, which is, and at harm none, do what you will, which, you know, a lot of Wiccans follow, you know, very much to the T. So they won't, you know, ever do like a hex or, or anything that plays with anyone's free will. And then there's kind of like another, you know, subset of people that are like, well, the Wiccan read doesn't necessarily have any historical reference, you know, in, in terms of going, you know, back in the day and previous witches and, and what they actually did. So, you know, trying to take witchcraft in a way back to its earlier forms and kind of reclaiming part of that edginess isn't the right word, but I'm trying to think of what, what I mean, but just kind of reclaiming that, that darkness isn't quite the word either, but <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I just, always, like, not holding yourself into just working with like the light, like working more with like left hand paths and, and kind of exploring, you know, maybe the darker part of yourself. Yeah, what do you make of the left-hand path and exploring this, you know, this shadow self? Well, I recently, I wrote a book review on my blog about this book called The Devil's Dozen, 13 Craft Rites of the Old One. It's by Gemma Gary, and her book was really inspiring. It's just 13 different rituals, and they're all a bit, um, like, subversive and... And a bit out there. But I was just like obsessed when I was reading this book. And I haven't tried really these rituals yet. But they're like um, based on folklore, like British folklore. Like one mentioned going to a churchyard, like walking around it counterclockwise, going to a gravesite and like meeting a toad or something like that. And it's kind of these very kind of of dark and, and a bit spooky rituals. Like one ritual she mentions finding a secluded space, maybe like an old barn, and going there overnight, lying naked on the floor in like a pentagram, and just kind of staying awake and letting the kind of fear kind of take hold of you until you enter like a trance-like state. And within that trance state, you can connect with the spirits of the wild. So kind of reconnecting with your own fear and using that fear as a trance technique and and way to kind of surpass our mundane world and experience the spiritual in in an entirely new way. So I'm not sure how many people have actually performed these rituals, but I'm really curious if someone has. <laughs> if they have and they're out there, let me know because I want to talk about your experience. <laughs> yeah, and let me know too. I would love to talk about that as well. That sounds super fascinating and really stupid at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about like, oh, there's no way I could, you know, do this in Chicago. Like, yeah. I'm either going to be murdered or arrested. <laughs> well, it's just like, yeah, it just, you know, and maybe it's just the stigma that comes with it, you know, just... It's really hard, I think, sometimes to 
like even if you consider yourself open-minded or deprogrammed or whatever woke as they say on social media yeah. now there's still that that deep rooted bias or fear or whatever against paganism i think yeah. it is more popular it is more accepted but at the same time it's been demonized for so long Oh, yeah, definitely. And when you say pentagram, there's going to be a lot of people that that hear this that are like, whoa, that's some demonic stuff. But it's really not. Yeah. And I mean, I've had experience with that. I had a horrible time in high school where like I wore like a pentagram necklace and got bullied a lot. So I don't even like wear a pentacle necklace today. I mean, I could. I'm much more self-confident now. But I just, in a way, it's just like I've dealt with that hassle so much of like, people seeing it and then making assumptions that it's, you know, sometimes it's just like, I just want to go to the grocery store without getting, you know, looks. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> but part of, part of the reason I wanted to do my blog and am active on social media is I want to kind of break down some of those prejudices and misconstrued like assumptions. And I think things are less scary when you know someone who's doing it you know and I kind of just social media like puts you out there and other people can see like wow you know she's she looks normal she's you know my age or whatever and and she's doing this and you know she's not getting struck down by Satan or anything like that so maybe it'd be okay for me to you know do some research myself you know (laughs) right well Satan only exists if you are a Christian right I mean that's that's a very Christian idea still yeah, so it it is a Christian idea, though. The concept of kind of Satan, or at least kind of like a, a horned male deity, kind of comes in part from paganism and like the, the wild hunt, you know, and oh, yeah. um, the god character, you know, who reigns over um, animals and, and wild masculine energy. So it's kind of, Satan was kind of took that and turned it into something dark and and evil but the horn god is kind of just a a representation of masculine energy and you know the the wilds of the woods and all these kind of great positive things and and even among wiccans there there's like this kind of tension about um or there's kind of this urge to to focus too much on the goddess and i feel like sometimes people forget like the the god character So maybe like part of the traditional witchcraft movement is kind of helping bring that back and kind of leveling things out a bit more, which is probably good. Yeah, I mean, I would think it's good for the movement as a whole. But okay, so explain to me in layman's terms, then what the difference really is between witchcraft and Wicca? Wicca is like a religion. It's much more of a religious act. There's rituals. And yes, you do witchcraft as part of Wicca, but you don't need to be Wiccan to practice witchcraft because witchcraft is a craft. It's something you do. So you can be Christian and practice witchcraft. You can be pagan and practice witchcraft. So it's kind of just, it's not, you don't need to be religious to do it. Anyone can do it. So that's kind of the difference. It just happens to be that most Wiccans practice witchcraft, but you don't have to be Wiccan. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was kind of my understanding of it to begin with. But, you know, as someone who practices, I was just trying to see if there was any other interpretation there. You know, speaking of of this, we've been talking about witchcraft and Wicca. We've been talking about social media's role in it as well. You recently did a video around the hashtag Be The Witchy Change. I'm not sure what that was because I didn't didn't know what it was until you shared the video with me. But... Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it, it seems like there are some challenges that that people in this community face on social media, creating their content. What do you see out there? Why did you make that video? Yeah, I made that video because I had seen other people talking about it. I had a YouTube channel over a year ago, and I did a few videos, and then I just ended up deleting it because I just, you know, I didn't want to handle, like, the hate on it. So I've recently restarted a YouTube channel and then I saw um, these other girls on YouTube talking about how so many witchy YouTubers have been um, kind of just like bullied off the platform. Just just like so much hate going on and 
And and it's not even from like the wider world. It's it's from you know other witches, which is you know just very hurtful and and stuff like that. And most of it tends to be around just people arguing about if someone's oh she's like um, what people call like a, a fluffy bunny or someone who just works with you know the right hand path or something like that or she's not dark enough or she's not edgy enough or she's too edgy or she's not following the book and read so she's evil or this doesn't represent us so there's just a lot of infighting that um has kind of caused a lot of people to kind of just like turn away from sharing you know on social media and and especially youtube lately so I kind of just wanted to make my own response and just, you know, say how this, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to have all this infighting when it's something we shouldn't be worried about. I mean, paganism in general and and people who practice witchcraft tend to be really open and accepting people. I mean, pagans, you know, have traditionally been extremely accepting of, you know, different types of people who practice various different things. So it's kind of it might just it might not just be the pagan movement. I think it's um just internet culture in general and especially like recently has become so um vitriolic that it's just kind of like just goes downhill. You know, you post something and then it's just like, you know, you get all this hate immediately and like I'm I'm a bit older now so like it doesn't bother me like it did, you know, back in the day, but you know, for these young people, you know, going on there who, who might, you know, they might say something wrong, or they might not have the right way of doing things yet, because they're brand new, and they might have had misinformation or whatever. But the point is, they're figuring it out, and they're sharing. So we should just be happy that they're, you know, figuring it out, and they're, they're interested. It was kind of just a whole thing to kind of just help cut down on, on the hate and try and bring us, you know, a little bit more together. And it, it kind of caught on. I mean, there's a lot of people that are posting videos about it and like hashtag on Instagram and, and Twitter and stuff like that. So it's made like a, a big positive change, which I'm happy to see. Yeah. And <laughs> vitriolic is a good word to describe, you know, the world at large right now. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned you mentioned politics a while back here and not to get too political, but there is a recent intermixing i think is is the way that you phrased it to me before we started talking here a recent intermixing of witchcraft with modern feminism and the current political crisis what's going on in in that area of the world that has your attention right now well recently it got picked up by like just the main media channels about the whole like hex trump movement and so that's just interesting in general to me that like you know, normal news networks were commenting about this to begin with. And then at um, the Women's March, I saw a lot of signs that people had taken pictures of their signs. And a lot of them said something like, we are the um, granddaughters of the witches you didn't burn or kind of just using (laughs) witchy like sayings and and iconography to show female power and as part of like the resistance. And um, witchcraft has kind of often shown up um, in political protest throughout, you know, the the decades, and it's kind of just made this this resurgence. And especially within the whole, um, like, Women's March and Women's Movement. And it's interesting to me, because the witch, in general, is kind of like this concept of, of power that's feminine by default, because, like, when you think about women achieving power in like um, modern society through like business or finance or something like that. It's usually a place of power that men have already achieved, but like with witchcraft, it kind of reverses a little bit. So even though there are, you know, plenty of, of male witches, witchcraft is traditionally associated with women. So it's like a, a woman's, you know, historical power, a power that's been traditionally dominated by women. So I get why it's like has that appeal for, you know, women and in, in politics and that political movement. So, yeah, I just, I think it's it's interesting. I, I think it'll keep going. Um, and I think there's, there's going to be more interest within protest movements and incorporating kind of witchcraft, especially like women's marches and things like that. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah. Well, I'm all for hexing politicians. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I lend all my support to these witches that are doing whatever they can to make some change here. 
Yeah. Not that not that I care who's in office because I think either side is bad. But let's transition a little bit away from witchcraft and Wicca and talk a little bit more about something that I know has your interest, and it's Norse paganism. And yeah. particularly, I guess it's part of a broader movement of you know this these pagan and occult themes that that are becoming more prevalent in popular culture, but. We nailed down Norse paganism as one thing that stood out in pop culture. We mentioned the Vikings TV show, Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology book. Why do you think there's this resurgence in interest in Norse mythology? Because that too has been demonized for a long time. Yeah, and you know, I'm not sure I I have the answer of like why Norse mythology, but I think it's it's interesting that um in Western culture, we grow up with like our our primary introduction to mythology is Greek and Roman mythology, and we kind of go from there. So we're kind of um, used to kind of Greek and Roman myth and Greek and Roman stories, and we've been you know reading those and sharing those and you know producing art of these myths for centuries now. And the Norse myths are a bit a bit messier, a bit less contained, and, you know, they're, they're not always, like, full, complete stories. And what the, like, the TV show Vikings, you know, even though it might not be, you know, super historically accurate, and Neil Gaiman's book is what they're doing is they're taking these kind of myths that might be a bit difficult for people to kind of connect with um, because, you know, they might be the translations might be a bit, you know, old fashioned or there's, you know, pieces missing or, you know, things like that. And they're making them into this kind of easier to digest stories and characters and mythology that kind of you just read, read it, especially in Neil Gaiman's book. I definitely recommend it. Um, You just read that and you're just like, connect with it immediately. And um, that's something that's kind of hard to do if you just straight out like read the poetic Edda which is where a lot of these these myths come from. And so they're kind of just making it more accessible is is what these kind of things are doing. And by making it more accessible, it's become so exciting. I mean, I, I at least feel a lot of connection and a lot of interest in the Norse gods lately because they're, they're very complex characters. And I think people are interested in paganism because partly because they like the fact that the gods and goddesses are more human in the sense that, you know, they're not necessarily good people. They have faults and it's just relatable. You know, the stories are relatable to us and they're easier to understand because they go through similar things that we go through. I think that's probably why they've been demonized is that when you humanize something like that, it becomes more identifiable and it becomes more empowering to you as an individual creator, as someone who could easily get in touch with your own divinity It just seems like, you know, Christianity externalizes everything. I think paganism in general internalizes it a lot more. Yeah. And it also kind of makes our human things that we do more divine, like, like love, you know, you think of like Aphrodite or something like that. And it's just like, well, you can connect to what she's about because we've all experienced love. You might call on Dionysus, you know, before getting, you know, a bunch of friends together for a big feast or something like that, something relatable. And in a way, it makes our own human rituals that we do, you know, and sharing stories and eating and and um, relationships and all of that stuff. It kind of makes that more divine. It kind of makes being human. It kind of elevates these essentially human qualities of ourselves, which I find very appealing. Whereas then Christianity or, or other, you know, more monotheistic religions might take some of these human qualities and say that those are aspects that we need to hide or that they're somehow sinful or, or we need to avoid those. And, and instead, you know, pagan deities tell us to exalt those aspects to ourselves to enjoy them because that's what we're here for. In a way, it's a more, more relaxing spirituality and more inspiring, or at least it is to me. 
<laughs> no, no, so. I, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. It's, it's one that's not based in fear, you know, like rooted in this idea that if you don't do as this text says or, or this entity says that you're going to some terrible place after you die, it's just a much more accessible idea to me personally and to you as well and to a lot more people. You know, I haven't read the Gaiman book, but I'm a huge fan of his writing. I've read well, most all of his stuff. What was it about the book again that, that you said that, that you liked? Well, it just kind of made the the myths easier to understand than reading them in their um, uh, historical form. So he writes them as kind of, he tries to stay as historically accurate as possible, but gives himself some liberties in order to like fill in the gaps to kind of create create the stories in more of a easily digestible narrative that we're familiar with. So it's kind of like he creates, he makes them into like um, story arcs that make it both easier to understand and also easier to connect with the characters. And he gives the characters, or, or the gods, I should say, um, a lot of personality. He really, you know, nails down Loki and how how he's such like a complex character and in the sense that he's very mischievous and and the gods respect him, but at the same time are always cautious about him. And then Thor, he kind of breaks down Thor for us because we always, you know, see him as this mighty hero. But, you know, actually in the Norse myths, he's kind of not too bright. And so he like interjects some of that humor, just makes who makes Thor just more relatable and more interesting. Uh, just kind of brings brings it, you know, to a much more... Um, level we can understand it easier so it's um, for someone who's just started to become super interested in Norse mythology it's like the perfect starting off point so I feel like you can start with reading his book and then you can start reading like the historical texts and you know go from there and start drawing more and more meaning from it it's kind of like how when you're trying to learn a complicated subject, it's sometimes best to read the Wikipedia page first. So you kind of get the lay of the land, you get, you know, the basics down, you get it's easier to digest, and then you, you know, use that as a jumping off point to really hit the 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 core ideas and morals that you can gain from it. For sure, yeah. I'm I'm familiar with Norse myths. I'm not an expert by any means. So that's a good recommendation for myself and for anybody who is interested in learning more about that. Hey, if you've seen Vikings, you're probably interested. So yeah, I guess we should pick up that book. Do you have a favorite Norse myth? I really like this one um, that he mentions in, in the book. I don't want to give too much away, but um, Thor is off fighting the giants. So the rest of the gods are trying to build a wall to protect themselves while Thor is away. And this mysterious man comes and says that I'm going to build this wall for you and I'll build it in a one season. And then if I succeed, you'll give me um, Freya as a bride. And, you know, so all there, there's all this debate. Should we do it? Should we not do it? And of course, Loki's like, well, he'll never finish in time. Let's let's go ahead and accept the offer but knowing that he'll never finish we won't have to pay him a penny and we'll get it all done for free and now we'll be protected and this mysterious stranger has a couple tricks up his sleeve and has this kind of magical horse that's able to bring all these limestone rocks to help build this wall and it's about to be done in just in time and Loki's like oh my gosh oh no what are we gonna do he's actually gonna build the wall when he said he did and we're gonna have to give him Freya she's not gonna be happy about that so Loki turns himself into a female horse to um, catch the attention of the the stranger's horse and lead him away so he can't finish the wall in time. And uh, Loki, as the female horse, because he can shapeshift, becomes pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other gods make fun of him from that point on. That's kind of a sore point of contention. But he, you know, he saved all the gods in this way, but he had to, you know, get get impregnated by by a <laughs> horse in order to do it and they're all making fun of him now so it's kind of just <laughs> it's just such a funny just out there myth that i just love and that's how um uh if you know anything about um odin has this horse called i'm sure i'm pronouncing it wrong but slept near it's this eight-legged horse so that's that's loki's baby so wait so these myths have morals what's the moral of that one you think i guess 
be careful of strangers who are promising you things that might be too good to be true and they might have a couple of tricks up their sleeves. But mm, yeah. so don't listen to Loki because... <laughs> well, I was going to say, like, isn't Loki based on the traditional trickster figure? Yeah, he definitely is the trickster in, in the story. But he's also very smart, too. So that's what's great about a trickster god is you kind of root for him even though you know he's causing chaos. Well, I mean, Tom Hiddleston is the most popular guy in the Marvel Universe, it seems. So, yeah. <laughs> My favorite myth, and I don't even know if it's really a myth, but it's more like an anecdote, but just the fact that Odin hanged himself on the Yggdrasil to gain knowledge of this runic alphabet that he passed yeah. on. That has always been like just my favorite bit about that. And that's that's sort of an introductory level Norse myth, but right. it's one that I've that's always stuck with me. The Yggdrasil was actually the first part of Norse mythology that I was introduced to through something that wasn't even about Norse mythology. I was reading this book many, many years ago called House of Leaves. I don't know if you've heard oh of it. Oh my gosh, I love that book. Yeah, it's it's probably my favorite book, and I could talk about it for hours. But, you know, in the back, the, the Yggdrasil is, is featured. Yeah. I didn't know what that was when I read it. You know, I was probably like, I don't know, 18, 19, and I was like, what is this Y word? But once I started researching it, I was like, oh, man, this, this is pretty, uh, this cosmological tree is pretty, pretty intense when you actually read about the the nine worlds of of Norse cosmology and at 19 years old or however old I was it's one of those mind expanding world sort of changing things that you could pull up on wikipedia and be like oh shit this is i have i know nothing about this but it's changed my entire life for the next 2 weeks yeah it's it's definitely really cool i remember when i first learned about um Idrisil and the different realms and everything like that. It was just, I was like looking on, on Google for like artwork because it's so hard to visualize all these like different worlds and how they all connect and things like that. It was just like really cool to like think about it and and visualize, you know, what it what it might be like. And, and you mentioned Odin, you know, hanging from the rune tree. Odin's just definitely uh, my favorite Norse god and, and he's just, he's so obsessed with um, obtaining wisdom and knowledge. And that's why he's got one eye because he gave one of his eyes in order to, to gain that wisdom. So there's just, there's just like so much to the Norse myths. And, and even though I've, I've only been studying for maybe a little less than a year for Norse mythology, but I'm just like, there, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface and there's just so much to, to gain from it. Yeah, and you know, I mentioned that it was demonized or that it has been. That that's because it was closely associated with the Nazis back during the the 30s and 40s. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, and it's really frustrating. And even today, I I get really annoyed. I see some people on social media who will like they might be in the alt right or they might be neo Nazis, and they're like talking about Odin or Norse mythology or trying to kind of incorporate that imagery into their politics and I'm just I just get so frustrated because it's just doesn't make sense to me and it's I don't want people to associate any of that with Norse mythology so uh, there's you know there's you know a bit of that still today and and you got to keep an eye out for it but I think there's even this group in in I think it's England and they call themselves the soldiers of Odin and they're like a like a kind of a neo-Nazi type group. And I just, I got really annoyed when I found out that's what they were calling themselves. I guess it's because people think of Scandinavia and they think, well, this is like essentially a white culture or something, but there's nothing in, you know, Norse mythology that references white supremacy in any way. So it's kind of very frustrating for me and, and other Norse pagans that people are distorting and incorporating some of this iconography and to be fair, it's, it's not like a lot of people, but, it, you know, you do see it every once in a while in social media, especially. So it's something to, to watch out for. Yeah, I hate it when things like that get sort of misappropriated. It, it completely bastardizes it for, for no good reason. And it's just, yeah, it's very frustrating, especially when you've read or studied. We're talking about Norse myths specifically here. So when you've read or, or studied something like that, in depth and you understand it and then when you see people like that who probably haven't read it at all 
and don't understand it at yeah. all to bastardize it in some level. It's just, uh, it's very frustrating, like you said. Let's talk about a couple of specific blog entries that you've written. And mm-hmm. I, I pulled out a couple that I really liked. You mentioned that you wrote fiction. And one of my favorite fiction pieces that I found on your blog was The Wheel of Fortune. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I really, I really liked it because, well, personally, I was making notes for a series of novels based on the major arcana. So when I came across this blog entry, you, you're you writing a poetry series based on the same thing. So I was like, damn, that's that's like my idea, but it's it's not. It's, it's not at all. But I thought that it was cool. Tell people what this poetry series is about then. Yeah, so I just want to take the um, major arcana and see what inspiration comes from it. I've been studying tarot um, for several years. And I, you know, I am a writer, I love to write, and I I do like poetry. So I kind of want to see what kind of inspiration comes from each of the cards and kind of give them their own poem, their own character. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I want to um, incorporate some of my own artwork as well. So I'm working on that. And yeah, I'm I'm excited to, to see to see how it turns out. I really like writing poetry, especially and it, it lends itself very well to to tarot cards, which are especially the major arcana, which are representing these kind of big archetypes so that you can do a lot with them. And, you know, meetings can be kind of varied and open to personal interpretation, you know, at least somewhat. So so there's kind of a, a lot of freedom there. And I've always found that tarot is very inspiring. And I just I love reading tarot cards. I um, do readings on my website and I do usually like a da- daily reading for myself. And yeah, so I'm glad to hear you're thinking about writing uh, novels or something like that on, on the cards because there's just like so much to work with. I find tarot endlessly fascinating. Yeah, and I, I just like the fact that they're so archetypal. Like you can build, and not to give away my idea really, but you can build characters around these these archetypes that are within these cards. And I don't know if that's how you see it, but that's kind of how I see it, you know, like Oh, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. No, no, I'm not going to give examples because I don't want to talk about my own work. But um, <laughs> yeah, so let's transition away from that. Okay. Uh, no, let's let's stay on it for just one second. I've only been working with tarot, and again, very surface level, for about a year or a year and a half. I've only used the Rider weight deck. I think that's a good introductory deck, right? Yeah, yeah, that's probably the go-to. For- yeah, uh, yeah, it's definitely yeah. like the most famous, most popular one, I-, I would imagine. But to take the next step to up my tarot game, what do you recommend? Well, I just ordered a tarot deck the other day, and I'm super excited about it. It's called the um, Pagan Otherworlds Tarot, and it still has kind of some similar imagery from the Raider White deck that you would be familiar with, but it- the aesthetics of it is kind of almost like Renaissance oil painting feel to it. And it's just, I saw the artwork and I just thought it was absolutely gorgeous. It's by this small company, um, this design firm out of Chicago, actually. I think they're pronounced Usi. It's like U-U-S-I and they do a couple different tarot decks. Um, but that one, it kind of takes some of that classic iconography and takes it up a notch. So... I'm really excited. I get that in the mail tomorrow, and I can't wait to work with it. Oh, cool. um, <laughs> yeah, so I've kind of had fun discovering all these smaller um, kind of indie tarot brands and tarot companies. It, you know, our current time that we're living in is is great for tarot because it's so much easier for people to to do their own, create their own tarot decks and get their artwork out there and get it, you know, crowd crowdfunded and everything like that. So there's all these indie decks to discover now so that's kind of fun too from a purely artistic standpoint there's so much different inspiration and variety and decks that are doing different kind of creative things and so you know it's kind of just like endless you know you can just keep learning about the tarot meanings and their archetypes themselves and you also get a chance to as a huge art lover like I am you get to just feast your eyes on all of this amazing work that all these people are are creating out there 
Yeah, it's a pretty exciting time if you're into tarot for sure. I've seen like a lot of recent like Kickstarters and GoFundMe's or whatever they are. I mean, it seems like there's a lot out there, but it's it's also very hard to sort through like what deck is right for you. And is there a major difference in decks or is it just do they all like essentially communicate the same thing? Well, some decks do things a bit different than the more common iconography and and they choose to to put themselves out there and and going in a different direction but at the same time i think it's also like um a personal preference i think with tarot certain decks are going to speak to you more than others and you're going to connect with them more than others so it's kind of just seeing what's out there and getting your hands on a few different types of decks and seeing you know what connects with you okay You mentioned that you do, that you write about a lot of spell work and ritual ideas. Do you have a particular spell or ritual that you've done recently that kind of stands out? Yeah, um, my most recent blog post is is actually on a um, rose ritual bath and how to um, dry your own rose petals and incorporate them in your uh, magical practice. So I kind of just have a recipe of kind of making your own bath ritual using crushed rose petals and Epsom salts and regular salt and kind of mixing it together and then using the act as like a ritual bath in terms of a form of what's called the glamour magic, which would be used to increase your confidence or maybe your attractiveness. So it would be something you would, um, a bath that you would give yourself before like a big event or a date or something like that. So it's kind of just like a fun little thing. Well, so. I'm, I need some confidence and I need some attractiveness. So, <laughs> <laughs> And you don't have to use roses. You can use like different herbs. I mean, different herbs for different things. But No, I want to take a rose <laughs> bath. I want it to look like that scene in American Beauty. Yeah. You know what I'm talking <laughs> that, about? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. So that's fun too. I mean... I love working with, you know, flowers and herbs and stuff like that and in um, my spell work and rituals. So that's always fun. I also like the one that you wrote about, I think it was it was a while ago, about chord magic. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chord magic is, is something that's like super easy to do, especially if you're, you know, just starting out with spell work, because all you need is basically like a chord or a piece of string. And then you um, put your intention into each knot like you could do nine different knots in the chord and you might even like say your intention out loud each time you make the knot and then over like um, a series of days you take the chord out untie a knot visualize your intention becoming reality and then put it away and the next day you keep on doing it so it's a super kind of just easy basic ritual or sorry basic spell to get started in witchcraft. I mean, all you need is, you know, a piece of cord that you can easily tie and untie. You could even use a shoelace (laughs) if you wanted to. So um, I just think it's it's fun finding, um, or at least writing about spell work that's easy for anyone to do. And it's it's just, it, it works well too, I find. And just kind of having that where you're, you know, revisiting it for like nine days and you're untying each knot, you're kind of um, reconnecting with that energy and forcing yourself to refocus on that on that spell and your intention. Yeah, I like that because it was simple. And you know, like I said, I have a very service level interest in this kind of stuff. I mean, in terms of practice, like I, I don't do a lot of practice. I'm really new to that. But it just seemed like a, a good, simple introductory spell, I guess, or whatever you would call it. And one of the other things that I like is that, you know, you mentioned that you reviewed a book on your blog several minutes ago. And one of the things that I like the most about your blog is that you do that. And one of the best blogs I've read from you, or at least one of my favorites, was this review you did of this Japanese horror manga (laughs) called Uzumaki. Is that how you say it? Yeah. I love it when someone introduces me to something new which you did with that blog post. I had never heard of this before. And I think anyone listening to this would enjoy this book. I know it's not your book, but would you mind telling people a little bit about it? The plot's really intriguing. Yeah, so it's a um, Japanese manga. It is all about... So it's a horror manga, so you know it's going to be a bit spooky. But the premise is that what's scary about it is there's this town 
and people start discovering spirals, as in like the symbol throughout the town. And these spirals manipulate and contort people's minds. Um, they start noticing spirals in their own bodies that become malevolent. It's a bit hard to describe, but the entire concept of the villain in a horror being not like a person or a creature or anything that we're used to, but instead being a symbol or an idea to me is endlessly fascinating. And the artwork in this is just wonderful because you think about how many things are in spiral shapes that we encounter every day, like like a hurricane or a seashell or even like our eardrum or, you know, these different aspects of spirals that we incorporate in our daily lives. So when you read it, you start noticing spirals in your own life and then it starts to freak you out a little bit, which is so fun. And I'm a huge fan of horror movies and horror books and stuff like that. So I just thought this concept was was out there, but the way that he does it is just so well done and it's definitely unsettling. Yeah, the, just the plot reminds me of what I love about horror films too is that the most effective horror stories in general, I guess it's not just films, but is, well, no, I think it is more films, is when you you don't see what you're running from, you know, like they don't show the kid, you know, like if you watched Halloween, you know, Michael Myers isn't on screen very much, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's the, it's the idea that he's, that he's around. That's scary more so than it is actually seeing him. Yeah. I love those kind of horror movies that are, uh, or books too, that are a bit more subtle, definitely kind of build that, that suspense. And I think there's a lot more kind of like indie horror movies and, and things like that that are coming out now that are kind of breaking apart those, you know, stereotypical conventions that we're used to. So I, I love finding little gems like that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I was glad to stumble across that little gem on, on your blog. I haven't picked up the book yet, but I'm going to because I literally just read that post like this morning. So... <laughs> I wanted to make sure that we talked about it because I was super excited. I always like to to find new books or films and just go out and get them. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, so hey, Scarlet Ravenswood, this has been really fun. I appreciate your time. Tell people the URL of your blog so they can keep up with you. Yeah, so you can find me at arcane-alchemy.com and then you can also find me on Instagram at Arcane Alchemy. Well, there it is. <laughs> Scarlett, hey, thanks again for your time. Okay, great. It was good talking to you. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Scarlett Ravenswood, arcane-alchemy.com, at Arcane Alchemy on Instagram. Those are linked in the show notes, as is a lot of the other stuff we mentioned, so check out some of that if you're interested. Scarlet's blog tagline is capturing magic one moment at a time, and I think we did a little bit of that here today. I really enjoyed the chat, and I thought it made a great follow-up or companion piece to the previous episode with Jeff Wolf. A lot of similar threads running through both of those conversations. If you enjoyed the conversation, please drop the show a good rating on iTunes. I saw a five-star review recently from Night Snail. Interesting name there. Regardless, thank you for the five-star review. It said the show was really hitting its stride, and I also feel that way. I feel like I'm really settling into this right now. But I do have some different sorts of episodes coming up in the next month or so. I know the name Occult in the title may lead some folks to believe that I'm only focusing on things like we discussed here with Scarlet, witchcraft, or magic, or other things like alchemy and astrology. And while I am interested in those sorts of things, I also take the title of the show literally Occult culture or hidden culture and that allows me to explore a lot of different sorts of subject matter. I have a show coming up about one anecdotal piece of alternative health and wellness that I find personally intriguing and I just recorded an episode with a well-respected music journalist about the Rolling Stones and the famous incident at their 1969 Altamont Speedway concert and I'm also working on finalizing my first solo episode which includes some binaural beats. So all of that's coming up in the next couple of months plus more conversations like the one you just heard. Also, I've redesigned a bit of the website. If you haven't checked it out yet, it's oculturepodcast.com. More changes to that coming over the next few months. Exciting times ahead for sure. But that does it for me for now. Until next time, you've been listening to Oculture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself 
think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.